Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to our 2023 no Nogerbauer Lecture. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, Dr. George Helu, I would like to say a few words about uh, Gary Nogerbauer. Uh, for those of you too young, like me in the attendance, who didn't get a chance to cross path with, uh, with Gary. So Gary was born in Germany in 1932, uh, passed away, unfortunately, a few years ago in 2014 in Arizona. So Gary got his bachelor in uh, physics from Cornell in 1954 and PhD in physics from Caltech in 1960. Gary worked at JPL for a few years before joining the Caltech faculty in 1962. So uh, Gary is, is really world famous for being a founder of infrared astronomy. So his achievements are quite legendary, from his involvement in the IRAS uh, satellite to founding IPAC, as well as his key role in the design and construction of Keck Observatory. Together with Robert uh, Layton at Caltech here, Jerry, Gary performed the first infrared sky survey at 2 micron, cataloging more than 5,000 sources. Gary trained generations of scientists, some of which, including in this room, went on to the very successful careers we all know. So the speaker today is George Elou, research professor of physics and executive director of IPAC. Uh, George has been at the helms of IPAC since 1999. Is that right? <laughs> so um, as IPAC director, uh, George oversees science operations for multiple space telescopes and major astronomical archives. He also seeks and develops science opportunities for IPAC and IPAC scientists. So George uh, grew up in Lebanon. He graduated from the American University of Beirut uh, with a bachelor in physics, then earned a PhD in astrophysics and radio science from Cornell in 1980. So at Cornell, George worked with Frank Drake on interstellar radio communications in the presence of scintillation. He also worked with Carl Sagan and, and Drake on putting together the famous Voyager Golden Record. However, uh, George told me he didn't take space-based astronomy very seriously until coming to Pasadena as a postdoc to work on IRAS data. I think that story is right. <laughs> So George uh, essentially never left uh, after that. He joined the Infrared Astronomy Group, the IRA, uh, together with uh, Gary Nagaborer and Tom Sofer. So George initiated the NED uh, Extragalactic Database with a few folks here, then turned to ISO to follow up on IRAS discoveries. He eventually focused on the Spitzer mission and became the IPAC Executive Director in 1999. George's research uh, has ranged from cosmology to solar system objects, galaxies, interstellar medium, star formation, and galaxy evolution. He has received numerous awards, including the Gruber Cosmology Prize in 2018 for the Planck mission, the Kuwait Prize in Basic Science uh, Physics in 2016, and several NASA medals, including the Distinguished Public Service Medal in 2020. He served as the president of the Academy of Science of Lebanon from 2014 to 2018 and was elected a fellow of the American Astronomical Society in 2022. He has held several invited positions in Europe, including Florence, Leiden, Paris, and he has developed, uh, delivered uh, science public lectures all around the world. So for the lecture today in honor of Gary Nogebauer, George is going to tell us more about simple behavior of complex galaxies. Thank you, Dimitri, for this kind invitation, uh, introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly pleased and uh, touched to be speaking uh, today for, on, for the Neugebauer Lecture because this year marks 40 years uh, since the launch of IRAS and 20 years since the launch of Spitzer. So this is really a special year. Moreover, the, today's date is sort of the median between the launch date of IRS and the launch date of Spitzer. So um, it's, it's particularly um, uh, challenging to, to try and capture what, um, what 
importance uh, Gary had in, in the field of infrared astronomy, not just at uh, Caltech, but uh, worldwide. So I have organized my talk uh, around this simple notion of saying, if you look at galaxies, I don't have to explain to you how complex, how diverse they are, how many different physical phenomena um, they encompass. Uh, and then occasionally you will see that they come up with some very simple behavior. Um, and in particular in this case, I'm showing the SEDs uh, all the way from uh, radio to gamma rays. This is just straight out of net, so no processing, no special treatment. Uh, and you can see that they sort of fall into special categories. Now you'll say, okay, I've done dimensionality reduction and all of that, but I'll try to convince you that that's not all there is to it, that there's really simplicity in the spectra, which we don't get uh, other ways. So the way I'll try to sort of, uh, honor uh, uh, Gary's memory and uh, uh, contributions is to pick up sort of three threads, one about the importance of unbiased surveys, uh, one about the value of clean data, well characterized, well described, and uh, uh, well cataloged, and, and then of course IPAC. And the point here is that these are themes that Gay was, was passionate about. He uh, clearly believed in them and uh, thought they were a very important part of doing science. So let me start with uh, the first thread, which has to do with surveys. Uh, so this is a summary of uh, sensitivity of all sky surveys, and there are some other things thrown in here. So this is the IRAS survey sensitivity. These divisions are one order of magnitude. Uh, Spitzer, of course, was not an all sky survey instrument, but um, it was capable of surveying pretty rapidly, and so, uh, and it actually did survey uh, a fair am amount of the sky. And so the, um, and of course it came uh, quite a bit deeper than uh, uh, IRAS, even for sort of casual surveying, which is what is indicated by these dark uh, blue points here. Um, so the, uh, and of course there were other wavelengths, but I'm gonna uh, focus for today's talk on the 10 to 100 micron range. The thing to keep in mind in the extragalactic survey uh, regime is that you're looking at galaxies whose spectra rise uh, as you go from 10 to 100 microns. And so if you have a flat sensitivity like we had with IRAS, you naturally gravitate towards the longer wavelengths for doing the survey. That's where you anchor things. But if you have, as we did with uh, Spitzer, a, a more sensitive channel at 24 microns, the shape of the SED drives you towards that. So um, looking back on IRAS, the galaxy surveys were anchored at 60 and 100 micron. A great example of that is the IRAS Bright Galaxy Sample, which was anything brighter than five Jansky. Uh, Tom, who's sitting back there, led the, led the effort on that. That uh, revealed uh, several very interesting phenomena, but including, included among them is the ultra-luminous infrared galaxy phenomena, which was completely unexpected. Galaxies which were 100 times more luminous in the infrared than in the visible. Uh, the archetype is R220. And then motivated after that, looking at luminous infrared galaxies, which were championed by Lee Armas and company, uh, and are still uh, 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 very interesting objects to study and learn about, uh, about, especially about the interaction between AGN, star formation, and feedback, and so on. Uh, there were redshift surveys that went even to, to fainter limits, uh, and those yielded even more luminous objects like um, IRS F10 to 14, at 10 to the 14 solar uh, luminosities. I also followed up on IRS, but we got very few um, full spectra really covering the mid to far infrared. Spitzer went much deeper both in the discovery space and in the little bit of surveying it did, uh, and also, of course, in the uh, spectroscopic follow-up, and clearly the action shifted to 24 micron. So my contribution there was to lead a legacy science program called the 5 Milijansky Unbiased Spitzer Extragalactic Survey, 5 Muses for short, which was anchored to 24 micron and um, which was essentially the best place to go for extragalactic. It was defined by uh, picking sources which were relatively compact uh, relative to the, uh, to the slits uh, Spitzer carried, uh, and brighter than 5 Milijansky uh, 24 micron, no other uh, constraints. 
They were selected from early survey fields. Uh, the, and then what we did was we just went to, back to Spitzer and got uh, low resolution infrared spectra from 5 to 35 micron. And that's most of what we'll talk about today. We got some high resolution uh, data for the brightest of them and we improved on the photometry. The science was that we wanted to bridge the gap between the nearby objects that were well known from before Spitzer, were well studied and, and were, getting, were yielding great results, and the more distant and faint sources that were being pursued. So uh, we wanted to characterize the population of sources that, that made up the cosmic infrared background. Ultimately, uh, the 24 micron band went down to 50 microjansky. So this was still just the very top of the iceberg of that particular iceberg. So this is what the data looked like just on first, first look. Uh, you have the, the imaging field. So you can see the, the objects in the back. You can see the, the, the three different, very different uh, spectra, and I will say more about that as, as we go. Uh, and what I have now is just a, a series of um, just a handful of, of typical spectra that we got. Uh, on the left hand, you can have, there's a, a, a AGN dominated um, spectrum with very few features. On the right hand side, you see one that is a mixture because it shows both the aromatic features, about which I will say more. But it also, oh, by the way, the, the top is just the observed spectrum and the lower frames are the uh, uh, rest frame uh, spectrum. So, and the, the striking thing about this object is it has all of these signatures of star formation, but it also has O4, neon 5, um, uh, neon f uh, and let me see, neon 3. Anyways, a lot of signatures of AGN, high ionization, but also strong H2 lines. So this kind of mixture is, is, a, is a common theme. These are all star forming systems. By the way, if you will notice here, it says from IRS. We did not know the redshift of this source, but when we got the infrared spectrum, we were able to determine a redshift. These uh, last two objects are both AGN. This one is uh, quite a rare sp specimen. It, has, um, it is showing emission at 10 micron in a silicate band. Uh, and this is a pure starburst where, again, you see all of the high ionization species uh, lines. Uh, indicating a, an AGN. So by now I've talked about these um, aromatic features. Uh, so by the time Spitzer flew, we, we knew enough about them that uh, they were quickly established to be a good uh, discriminator between star formation and AGN powering the, the, the system. And uh, the equivalent width of these aromatic features was in particular a, a, uh, a very useful measure. And so for the sample we selected, now this is after the fact, we, we, uh, this is jumping a little bit ahead, but it make, makes the rest of the talk flow more easily. Um, so this is the distribution that we observed of the equivalent width of aromatics. And you can see there is a bimodality, which we think is real. Uh, these are the upper limits shown as the uh, dotted line. Uh, and you can see that um, about you know, a little bit less than half are definitely in the uh, star forming camp. Uh, about a third are in the AGN camp and the rest are composites. By the way, we also measured H2 rotational lines, um, which are, as you know, uh, just the right thing for A, uh, measuring mass, and B, for, uh, uh, as traces of shock excitation, and a whole bunch of fine structural lines, but I will not say anything about them today. So, um, and the reason I showed that plot first is that uh, the next few histograms will differentiate between the star burst or star formation driven uh, systems in, uh, in the bluish tint here. The AGNs are in red and the, the uh, composites are in this ochre color. And this is just the sum of all three. So this is distribution of uh, fluxes that we, we had, and this is the distribution of redshifts. This is an after-the-fact distribution. And you can see we go, the, the highest redshift we found was 4.3, uh, but in this plot we're showing only up to uh, 3. 
And combining those, you get the luminosity distribution. And you can see we have some extremely luminous objects and some quite uh, low luminosity objects. The peak of the distribution is at 10 to the 11 solar luminosities, which is just where the lurks start. And I'm going to take six galaxies, all of which sit in, in very close to 10 to the 11, and, and just give you a glimpse of, it, of a, an immediate result from that uh, from the, uh, uh, the data collection, which is that, okay, so we know the aromatic features, also known as PAHs for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, they come in these groupings uh, between 6 and 20, so the most prominent ones are uh, between 6 and uh, 10, and then there's another group at 11 and 12, and then one more group up at uh, 17. Uh, so they vary, as you can see, these are simply six galaxies where the spectra are normalized at 24 microns, and uh, that's what the colors indicate. And so you can see the aromatics vary in, in, in uh, prominence uh, quite, quite a bit. You can also see that occasionally we have a deep absorption uh, at 10 micron in the silicates. And the other features which are not so easy to make out are the continuum emission components. There's a, at the longer wavelengths you get the black body emission from grains in close to thermal equilibrium, and then at the shorter wavelengths, you get the very small grains that get excited uh, stochastically by photons and radiate uh, uh, at very short wavelengths uh, so that they are not in thermal equilibrium, but they're constantly fluctuating, but they give you what looks like uh, very hot dust at uh, um, hundreds and occasionally 1,000 degrees. So that's one snapshot, and you immediately uh, conclude from that that knowing the luminosity is not enough to know what the SED looks like. Um, it is true that as you go to higher luminosities, you shift the population towards AGNs, but uh, if, you have a, if, you, if you're using a model where the population is modeled to have a certain SED shape that is one-to-one -one mapped to luminosity, you should be very careful in using that model. Uh, and, of course, the, these variations suggest that we have uh, multiple components along the line of sight. So, cutting to the chase, we found that using the equivalent width in, in the aromatics is a, of the aromatic features is a much better way to sort on the, on the um, SEDs. So, here we're, we've done exactly that. Again, it's the same split between the star-forming galaxies on top, the um, composites, and the AGNs. Uh, and this is uh, just taking a, the, the dis dispersion here. The bands show just the dispersion among the uh, systems in each class. Uh, and you can see that the, the shapes are pretty well distinct. You can even see that uh, even as you go to the far infrared, the AGNs and the um, uh, star-forming galaxies have distinct behavior at the far infrared. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say about that, and then another snippet of a result, of course, we went on, constructed star from, uh, we, we did decomposition of each spectrum into AGN and star forming uh, related emission, uh, and we constructed luminosity functions, so as just a cameo uh, result here by, for, uh, for luminosity functions, we, um, I show here a distribution of the luminosity functions uh, at 15 microns. So from the five Muses studies are these two lower curves. The top one is the total luminosity function. The, the one under it is the luminosity function of star formation alone. Uh, and you can see that as you go to the higher um, luminosities, AGNs become more important and star formation less important. Now I'm comparing that to the luminosity functions, a redshift of 0.7. By the way, the five muses, in effect, uh, is a, is, samples the universe at a redshift of 0.12. So here at a redshift of 0.7, the same thing, taken from two different papers and renormalized, you see again the, the same behavior with the AGNs becoming more important at higher redshift, at higher luminosity. But you also find that this shift is read. Uh, at the higher redshift, you have a higher density of, star, of uh, luminosity, and you have a, uh, a, a, a higher K 
characteristic luminosity at which the, star from a, the luminosity function turns off. So with all of this, uh, I got to wondering whether we can detect variability from AGN, uh, from the AGN component in the five music sources and how that would compare to this, uh, to this uh, um, discrimination we get from the equivalent width of uh, aromatic features. So we, we examined the Wise, Neowise, and ZTF uh, light curves for all five music sources. Um, so, well, there's some detail about how we got the photometry. I can answer questions later if anybody's interested. Uh, one important point is we smoothed everything to time scale of days on the assumption that uh, AGNs will not be variable on shorter time scales, and, uh, and we adjusted that to the redshift of the source. So the outcome is that variability was detected in about, in, in more than 15, and this is a conservative estimate, more than 15% of five music sources. Uh, for ZDF, uh, 38 sources were definitely variable, and there was a large number of sources for which we didn't have enough time uh, coverage with ZTF, uh, so we couldn't quite tell what they were, whether they were varying or not, so we call them indeterminate. Uh, with WISE plus, which is WISE plus new WISE, um, a slightly smaller fraction were clearly variable, uh, and I will show you in a second what that means. Uh, so the way variability is defined here is very simple. It's, it's a very uh, sort of naive definition. You just take the dispersion, all the measurements we've obtained, you normalize that to the expected accuracy of the measurement, the, 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 our best estimate of the accuracy, and that tells you uh, whether they are departing from a constant uh, light curve or not. This is what we're plotting here on the x-axis. This is a histogram. So you can see there's a, when I say they are variable, it's, it's a, they depart very well from the main body of, uh, of the objects. And so from about a ratio of one here in these funny units, uh, we consider these to be truly variable. This is the marginal variability, and these are not detected. And here are a few examples of what it looks like. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have sources which are variable in Ys, but not in ZTF. On the right, you have variable in ZTF, but not in Ys. And you can see that the variability has, you know, here's a case where it's a very slow uh, uh, run in, uh, in time, whereas up here you have higher frequency content. Uh, the same on the, down here, you have a very slow descent over the whole ZTF range, whereas up on top you have more uh, active uh, variability on. And here are four examples where we have variability in both ZTF and Ys. Um, and you can see they're not um, moving in step. Um, by the way, this, the, our sensitivity, of course, depends on magnitude on, of the source itself, and it depends on where you are in terms of coverage on the sky and so on. And so we were in the range of, um, in the best cases, we were sensitive to a little bit um, better than 0.1 magnitude, and in the worst cases, we could only pick out one magnitude of variation. Uh, and the observed variability ranges, as, a, as you see, from between 0.2 to 0.4 magnitudes, and uh, up to 0.6 in some cases. So this is a table showing co-variability in the two bands. So uh, you can see there's a minority of sources that 5% uh, or so that, that are variable in both bands. And then uh, you see the spread there. Uh, we have not found a convincing case of time correlation in the co-variability. So we, to, in order to go in and, and, and do simple models for uh, optical depth or, uh, uh, or reverberation or whatever. So, so that has not been possible. Uh, the time scales of variability generally look shorter in ZTF, but you gotta be careful because the uh, uh, ZTF samples much shorter time scales than, 
then why so? So we have to be careful with that. And now the comparison. Uh, this is showing the variability index on the y-axis versus the equivalent width of the aromatics. And as you can see, all of the variable sources come out of the AGN corner of the plot. Um, I have to say it was a bit of a surprise to me, but that's what we found. This is the equivalent plot for uh, Ys, neo Ys, right? Let me see. Yes, that's, that's for Ys. And um, again, same result. Uh, I think these stray points here are probably false positive positives, or they are an upper limit because uh, this plot loses the upper limit notation. So, um, all right, so this is uh, the end of my part one. The summary is that the mid infrared spectra of galaxies are a mixture of signatures, not surprising. Uh, they show quite a bit of diversity, um, especially driven by the AGN side. You know, when you get a star forming galaxy, it's pretty predictable. There are just maybe one or two parameters that might vary, but, but the rest is, uh, you know, the aromatics may be a bit stronger or weaker and so on, but by and large, they, they're very recognizable. And, um, and of course, they are better indexed by the equivalent width of the aromatics than by uh, infrared luminosity. Um, the visible light variability is detected only among galaxies with a low equivalent width. So in that bin, about half of the five music galaxies are variable. Um, so the covariability shows up in all combinations, but there's no time correlation to, uh, to constrain physical models. So um, let me take a short break to recognize all of the contributors to this uh, work. Uh, I've underscored the names of people who were, who were postdocs or students when they contributed. They are not postdocs anymore. Um, let me, for, for that part, let me uh, single out Danny Dale, um, Yan Ling Wu, and Yong Shi. Uh, and for the next part, uh, Eric Murphy, I think, is probably the biggest contributor. Ah, and Martin Gaskue, who was a uh, student uh, last year doing the, the work. So, the uh, value of clean, well characterized data, those who, uh, who knew uh, Gary in the IRS context. I'm sure we'll remember how uh, adamant he was about understanding every bit of uh, the processing, how it affects the results, um, uh, understanding uh, whether what you're doing is going to add noise. He would say, you don't need this noise. You don't have to add it uh, to, the, uh, to the signal. Um, so this story starts uh, early in the days of IRS when there was actually a, a, a real question, a, a real um, controversy in the community about whether the 1.4 gigahertz emission in the radio continuum measures star formation. Uh, and on the plus side, people were saying, well, radio synchrotron emission comes from supernova remnants. The, the cosmic ray electrons are, are accelerating star formation uh, uh, in, in supernovae, which explode when, when uh, young stars are formed, etc. On the negative, there was a, an argument that the radio disks were observed to be less steep than the star formation traces. And so they looked like the old disk profiles, and so they couldn't be tracing uh, star formation. Uh, by, the time, well, so by the time I, uh, I addressed this, the far infrared from IRS was accepted to be a good tracer of star formation. So it was simple. The existence or, or lack of thereof of a correlation between the fire infrared and radio would settle the question. And sure enough, the answer was that um, a, relatively, a relatively constant infrared to radio ratio is a property of star forming systems. So as you can see, I wasn't the only one pursuing this question, uh, but the advantage is that when I worked with uh, IRS data and with radio data, I had access to high quality data where we could make all the measurements, avoid the systematics, do the integration properly over extended sources and so on. So um, now when, when you're doing correlations, of course, it's an, it's an old problem. You, you're doing luminosity, luminosity, so you multiply both quantities by the square of the distance, and so you create correlation where there isn't any in the first place. That's why on the, on the left-hand side plot, I show 
the objects from Virgo that are all at the same distance in filled symbols and the other field galaxies in open symbols. And you can see Virgo pretty much covers the, the bulk of this, of this other sample. And these are the ones which are stretched by distance and they still follow the same correlation. So that was the, the first result. The other interesting result that came out immediately uh, was that if you take the infrared as an indication or as an indicator of star formation and you scale from that to the number of, of uh, supernova remnants and you compute the flux you expect, you find that it's deficient by about a factor of 10. In other words, you can't explain all the radio you see uh, with the just supernova remnants. So there has to be something else going on, diffuse wave, uh, diffuse shock wave acceleration and, uh, or other mechanisms. Um, now, the, the, the explanation came, the basics of it came relatively quickly, which is that we have massive stars that, that accelerate uh, cosmic rays when they go uh, uh, supernova, and then you combine that with a magnetic field, you get the synchrotron. These massive stars also heat the dust, and you get the infrared. Uh, however, you have all these other complications, you know, sort of real-world physics to, to take care of and, and uh, take into account, and so you have um, interstellar medium physics, you have the architecture of the galaxy, you have the environment of the galaxy, um, and so the correlation is not simple to explain, except in the, what's called the calorimeter limit, which means, which is the case where you dump all of the cosmic rays and the UV photons and you have an optically thick galaxy and so everything is converted into radio and infrared and so you get the, uh, the correlation. But if you have escape or other uh, uh, phenomena at work, it becomes complicated. So this is just a listing of all the different physical um, uh, terms that you have to take into account. Uh, I won't go through all of this. This is on the radio side. Um, it, none of this will be surprising to you. Um, so cosmic rays can escape. Uh, and the same is true of UV photons. They can escape. And, so the, the, and then there's optical properties of the dust grains and, um, and the effective depth and so on. So, uh, and there are other loss mechanisms uh, besides dust absorption. So the, the non-calorimeter galaxies uh, were the ones that I was interested in because they were the, the bulk of the original sample. And so I wanted to understand how you, uh, you get that agreement when you have sort of what's called the leaky box uh, galaxy. So uh, we put together this, so we, we, took an, we made an attempt at, at putting together a picture that specifically tried to get an effective optical depth of a galaxy that was not compact to the heating photons and to cosmic rays. Um, and so the, uh, the photons, of course, travel until they're absorbed and, and, and then the infrared emission comes out. The cosmic ray electrons decay slowly. They, they live for as long as 100 million years or longer and they um, uh, emit depending on the intensity of the magnetic field. So, uh, you have to have some kind of connection between the two optical depths. And so the way we did it is, is by relating the, the magnetic field strength to the density of the medium by, with a scaling relationship, was, which was at the time accepted as the range in which you might expect that relation. So the, the power law was anywhere from one-third to two-thirds. Uh, and then at that point you have competing scale lengths for the cosmic ray electrons, to either decay or escape. We also had an escape mechanism from the, for the galaxy. Um, and as I said, you have to have, to have to account for the different time scales for the two sides. So this plot, I'll try to explain it uh, um, starting in the lower frame, which shows the decay time, well, the escape time and the synchrotron time scales for cosmic rays. And, uh, and of course, whichever time is shorter is the dominant uh, loss mechanism. And as you can see, at low densities of the ISM, escape prevails, and at high densities, synchrotron decay prevails. 
associated with these, there is a travel time for the uh, electro for cosmic ray electrons, and you get um, escape length, of course, to match the escape uh, time at the at at the uh, and what it says is that in the diffuse systems, in the in the less dense galaxies, um, the cosmic rays uh, escape much more easily, and they don't travel as long before they escape. Uh, and then the, the, the travel time become, the travel distance becomes shorter at, in the dense systems. So, uh, so we were able to balance the two terms, and this is basically the ratio of the, uh, of the optical depth between the two. Um, the Milky Way sits somewhere around here, and you can see that as you go to the to the right, where you have higher density the, um, and higher optical depth, the, uh, you, go, you are in the calorimeter meters, uh, in the calorimeter limit. So the um, uh, the two terms are, uh, are one to one. So the model predicts, among other things, that radio emission is more spatially extended than infrared emission, uh, and explains why the disk that's observed in the radio is more diffuse than the one observed in H alpha. Um, okay, this is uh, a more sophisticated model that uh, Lackey et al. published in 2010, it's, and it shows very similar uh, results. So we had to wait until Spitzer came up with its images of galaxies uh, to be able to test that hypothesis. Um, these uh, galaxies, so as you can, okay, I think you can read the labels. The radio is on the, in the left column, the 70 micron Spitzer in the middle and 24 micron Spitzer in the left. Uh, they have all been uh, convolved to the same resolution. And just looking at them, you can sort of make out that the uh, VLA images are more diffuse versions of the infrared images. But you don't have to believe me or your eyes. You can uh, do a, a systematic test, um, which is to take the 70 micron uh, image and convolve it with a kernel. Uh, and the size of the kernel is on the x-axis here, and the y-axis has the residual between that convolved image and the radio image. Um, and the um, uh, residuals, as you can see, drop, and then they start increasing again. This is one specific galaxy, 5194. And so this is telling you that uh, for this particular scale length, uh, the description of the radio map as a smoothed version of the infrared map is actually uh, uh, applicable. And if you go on smearing, you, you lose that uh, uh, agreement. So uh, we were part of the SINGS uh, legacy survey when we did this. So this is all SINGS galaxies that had enough data to do this. And you can see that this behavior obtains in uh, most cases. There are some cases where these are very small uh, diffused dwarf galaxies where you don't expect things to work quite as well. But essentially, the, the model works in general. Um, I'm not going to talk up to this diagram. I'm just to say that we, we went on. Of course, we had the data were sufficiently good that we could do more uh, sophisticated analysis. We discovered that we had to, to deal with different components of the galaxy differently, and uh, there's a lot more you can read about in the Murphy et al. paper 2008, if you're interested. So sometime be, as we were doing this, uh, it became clear that the correlation itself, the bulk correlation, uh, there was really not much that's new there. So I sort of turned my attention not so much to the correlation itself, but to the exceptions of the correlation. So if you, if you have galaxies that have uh, very high radio, you can ascribe that to a radio loud AGN and you're done. But if it has, if a galaxy has, uh, is intense in the infrared and has very little radio, that is very hard to explain. And it turns out about 1% of infrared selected galaxies are, uh, have this characteristic. This is the archetype which we, was the first one we discovered, NGC 1377. Uh, this is, uh, so based on its uh, infrared luminosity, we expected this level of emission as a synchrotron from uh, uh, 
from the, based on the correlation. And when we went observing at the VLA, we found nothing but upper limits. And the, um, it wa the upper limits were even lower than where we expected the free free emission to come in from star formation. So that was uh, sufficiently interesting. We, we looked um, in more detail. Uh, so this is the same object. If you take an image, there is not much to suggest anything unusual except maybe a little bit of an asymmetry in the B minus I color, which may be hinting at uh, some kind of merger that is hidden behind <coughs> the stars which make up the spheroidal galaxy. So there's not much to see there. But then when we looked at the infrared spectrum, that's where the surprise was because we found that uh, it had very deep silicate absorption. Which, had, which was a tau of somewhere between 5 and 10, which translates to a tau of about 80 at V. Uh, and if where the, the far infrared part of the spectrum was much warmer than a typical galaxy, which runs 20, 30 K, it, it had more like um, 80, 90 K. Uh, and of course, the, the, the paths were unrecognizable, but it also had uh, traces of warm molecular gas, including um, rotational H2. This is the 28 micron. No, I'm sorry. This is, uh, no, that's not uh, rotational. But we did detect rotational uh, H2 in, uh, in the system. It had very weak neon two lines and very strong upper limits on the passion beta, bracket, gamma, etc. And it was not detected in the fine structure lines carbon 2 and 01. So, what do we make of this? Well, the, the most likely explanation for a radio-deficient galaxy is that it's a starburst after a long period of quiescence. So this, the starburst is on the order of a mega year old. And the reason you need that fresh is that you don't want to have had supernovae going off yet and polluting it with, with cosmic rays. Um, and before that, you have, had, you have to have no star formation for at least 100 million years to get rid of your old cosmic rays. And so that's what um, our hypothesis was. So you have to imagine somehow you set up a compact, uh, very dense uh, material that's ready to go uh, into a starburst mode, and you set it off all at once. And it ha there has to be a lot of... Uh, dust and uh, uh, and gas, uh, and because you have now stars forming inside, you can heat the uh, the the dust to temperatures as high as 80 or 100, and the dust actually competes with the gas for ionizing photons, and that's why you don't see any of the ionized uh, lines uh, emerging. Uh, this is similar to ultra compact H2 region, except on a scale that's uh, you know at least Ten thousands of these, tens of thousands of compact of these compact regions, um, and then you still have to have a lot of unilluminated dust to give you the silicate absorption. There were some alternative interpretations that uh, that were offered. They, it's very hard to rule out these alternatives just because your optical depth is so high; you can hide almost anything in there. But if you look at the um, so, for instance, uh, there is a suggestion that inverse Compton losses of the cosmic rays would take away uh, from the synchrotron and suppress the synchrotron. But the, it, it's very hard to do that because in, in other models, uh, uh, it, cosmic ray losses to inverse Compton never exceed the ones you get you to synchrotron losses. You can also come up with something like no magnetic field, which is quite exotic, but you know, there's no way to, or at least there's no simple way to check, check that. Uh, the buried black hole accretion uh, scheme is also very difficult to defend. But whatever the physical conditions, these must be short-lived phases or extremely exotic. Otherwise, you would find them more frequently than 1%. One, 1%. So uh, the good news is that we actually were able to identify uh, a number of these objects, we, we, we have about 20 good uh, candidates that combine all three conditions. Uh, very weak radio, very warm dust emission, and uh, high 
silicate absorption. And so these are uh, promising leads to, uh, to understanding things. So um, I, as I said, I sort of lost interest in the main correlation uh, work. And so I was quite surprised when I did a very simple search on the abstract saying infrared radio correlation, that there is a pretty uh, active scene there with sort of 30 papers per year just using that phrase in their, uh, in their abstract. Um, so in summary, um, the correlation continues to puzzle a, a simple relation involving many parameters and processes. Uh, and the, it must be telling us something that, that we haven't quite found about the, the way the, the ISM regulates itself and regulates star formation. Um, uh, I understand Phil uh, and his group are getting interested in simulating uh, more of not just the cosmic rays, the proton cosmic rays, but also the electron cosmic rays. I'm looking forward to seeing maybe there are some answers there. Uh, the deviations from the correlation itself um, are rare, but, and they, but they also challenge simple explanation, uh, but hopefully they hold clues to the physics. So most likely, uh, most likely interpretation is a brief protostar burst phase after a long quiescence, that's important. Uh, but there are many exotic alternatives, including uh, Kardashev type three civilizations across the whole galaxy. Uh, I would like to think this is just one of those uh, manifestations during the COVID uh, times. <laughs> but uh, in principle, it's doable. I never thought infrared radio correlation would touch on exoplanets, but <laughs> maybe I was wrong. Uh, Okay, so there's a, I, I want, so I mean, obviously there are lots of uh, questions you can ask about the balance of the uh, energy densities and so on. Let me get on to the last part of the talk, which is about IPAC. So this is a sort of the uh, history of IPAC in a nutshell. It was established as the infrared processing analysis center, which changed now, it's just IPAC. Uh, it was established to support IRS research. And then we started uh, NED in the, late 80s, I see Barry is sitting here. Barry and I led the charge on that. Um, and then TUMAS came around, the Infrared Science Archive was created primarily to, to serve the uh, TUMAS data. Um, then we participated in ISO and Spitzer of course was the, um, was the, the great moment in the uh, early 2000s. In 2009, Herschel, Planck and Wise uh, launched. And during that time we also established the uh, NASA Exoplanet Science Institute, uh, and we supported Kepler. So by the time 2010 came around, uh, IPAC was supporting five active space missions. And if you look at this list of missions, most of them actually had very significant uh, involvement by Caltech faculty. So the next infrared surveys are actually upon us. Um, and of course, everyone brings its own improved sensitivity. Uh, or specialized um, instruments. So Euclid launches in July. SphereX follows in early 2025. SphereX is going to be a, uh, a, 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 an amazing spectral uh, survey of the sky um, in the great tradition of the uh, all sky surveys, WISE, TUMAS, and IRAS. Roman follows in 2027, and NEO surveyor in 2028. And in spite of its name, NEO surveyor has tremendous potential for astrophysics, uh, both as a mapper of the sky and even more excitedly uh, for today's generation of students in time domain astronomy. And of course, and single, you know, fingers crossed, there's UVX and DSA 2000 are still in the formulation stages. Uh, so out of all of this emerges IPAC, which is sort of unique among the NASA science centers because of the multitude of wavelengths, techniques, and research areas, and and our collaborations. Uh, Gary's emphasis on, on unbiased surveys, on data quality, is really part of the IPAC DNA. And that drives you know, sort of calibration and accuracy, you know, systematics, biases, understanding your data, understanding what, uh, uh, what biases there might be hiding. And, all, and then documenting all of this, coming up with reliable information and make it usable for the science community. So the the work that uh, Gary did on IRAS has fed into TUMAS, WISE, NED, um, URSA, and now into ZTF. Um, uh, 
closing remarks, um, let me quote Roger Blandford. I know I can quote him because this is written down. Astronomy is data driven. And so this is the best argument for unbiased astronomical surveys and then uh, reliable, well characterized data. Um, finally, a thought on correlations. Correlations among galaxy integrated parameters mostly convey trivial physical content, such as luminosity correlates with luminosity, or, or the, the intensity of radiation correlates across the spectrum. A few correlations are unexpected, and, and those drive the field because their physical interpretation is not simple. So those of you who have been in this room many times will recognize this inscription, which is on the wall over there. Not all of you can see it. It's all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is to discover them. So what I'm saying is sort of goes counter to what Galileo was saying. So far be it from me to question Galileo's wisdom. Uh, so that got me looking for the original of this uh, statement because it, there's always some modifier or some, something that changes the, the flavor. Turns out, actually, there's no evidence that Galileo ever wrote or said anything like this. <laughs> so, um, so this, is <laughs> this is one of those questions that, are, uh, that I will leave to the audience. So thank you very much for your attention. Do we have time for questions? Mike. Yeah, um, George, I'd like to thank you for a great talk and for your role as the architect of the Spitzer operations. <laughs> thank you. As well as for management. My question is, I know now that ITAC is undertaking the mission operations role for a uh, JPL spacecraft going out to the moon before too long. Do you envision additional mission operations mission operations activities for ITAC going okay. forward in addition to the more traditional science operations? So, um, so Mike is asking uh, about the mission operations role we're fulfilling for Lunar Trailblazer, which is different from what we've done traditionally in science operations. So mission operations for those who, who don't live in that universe is the, the activity where you command the spacecraft uh, at the highest level as opposed to commanding the instruments, which we do when we're doing science operations. Uh, and so you're responsible for things like orbital insertion, mid-course corrections, and so on. And um, the, the answer to your question, Mike, are we going to do more of this, is that I don't know. I want to see how things go on Trailblazer before I, <laughs> I can tell you what, which way I would lean. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a long story. The real reason we're doing it is, is that it is a JPL mission and the PI is at Caltech, faculty at Caltech. So there was a request and so we started down this road and we're, we're doing an experiment. I'm interested in small missions, but that's different from doing mission operations. Well, it's well known that AGNs will show variability. The, the puzzle is why some of them show it only in the infrared show, and I haven't figured that out yet. Okay. Uh, but that's, so it's probably to do with the architecture of the system. Are you looking, um, is it completely uh, is wrapped in dust and obscuration, and so you can only see the infrared emerging? the variability part, uh, are you looking at it from a direction which is where? So uh, I, as I say, I don't know, I'm sort of, I have some ideas I'm playing with, but I don't have an answer yet. There was a question there. Yes, people have managed to improve that record. At the beginning, it, it looked like it was very hard to do. Um, uh, with with the longer wavelengths, you actually I think Mansi led a recent exercise on that. So on on 
going to longer wavelengths to find supernova explosions in nuclear galaxies. Yeah, I hope the, the, so you're asking about looking in the far infrared or in the? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Right, so uh, we, we have not done any surveys at the, f there was one, I think there were one, one or two small projects done with Spitzer looking for that at 24 microns. They were not terribly successful, but the difficulty is that your PSF is large and the, the scene is very rich and bright and so on. So I don't, I don't know that we've done better than that yet. So there's one there. And, yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the synchrotron radiation and the inverse Compton, but is it also possible that the medium to medium stress phase reabsorption is just kind of opaque to the beta heart species? And in that case, would it also mean that it's kind of suppressed in the infrared star formation rate of emission? So we did a quick estimate on, the, on whether free-free absorption could uh, uh, take out the synchrotron emission and it doesn't work. It's just, I mean, you'd have to have, you'd have to have H2 regions completely on the outside of where the synchrotron emission is taking place, which is unlikely because this, the, the cosmic rays will propagate out. So um, th that's a very good question. So we started with a large sample and we did a, a VLA survey to look for the radio counterparts. And not all of them were in this band of completely suppressed radio emission. So we do have some that are scattering towards the, the uh, but how you decipher whether it's there just after the starburst has started or just uh, older systems, we, we haven't done that part yet. But yes, there are, the distribution is not bimodal. It's not bimodal, yeah. I, I didn't have a distribution of the ratio, but it's not bimodal. So you're asking whether there is a relation between the temperature of the source and the infrared to radio ratio, the far infrared temperature. So uh, as, I, as I showed, the, for the radio deficient sources, in fact, we selected the sample to be infrared, for far infrared warm. Okay, so they are selected to be high temperature in the far infrared. Uh, because otherwise, because we needed to cut it down to a manageable survey to find the radio counterparts or, or lack thereof. So I don't know of any radio deficient sources that are not hot dust in the far infrared, that are not at temperature of 80 or hotter in the far infrared. Does that make sense? Yes. Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah. So I, yeah. Oh, the trend is, okay, so actually in the, 
I won't go back here, but in one of the plots that I showed at the beginning, the correlation between, f from the IRS days, between, between infrared and radio, I coded those points by, by far infrared temperature, and there was no difference between, you know. and it's, it's one of those topics which has been studied many times over by, you know, since then. And there is no, there is a small trend, but it's not a, it, it all depends on your definition of far infrared because that definition will, will be affected by the temperature. But there's no uh, significant, there's no strong trend uh, uh, that relates the radio to infrared ratio to the temperature at far infrared. 